I'm going to welcome Dr. Phil Simon up here. He's a USDA ARS research geneticist and professor of horticulture at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. His research in vegetable genetics and breeding has focused on carrot improvement, targeting improved flavor and nutritional quality, and nematode disease and abiotic stress resistance. He led the development of widely used carrot germplasm with high carotene content, sweet mild flavor, and purple color, and root knot nematode resistance. To complement his breeding effort, along with students and collaborators, he has developed breeding tools, including the sequencing of the carrot genome, and has collected carrot, allium, and other vegetable germplasm in 10 collecting expeditions. He has undertaken related plant breeding research, including the first production of true seed in garlic and the development of cucumber and melon germplasm with orange color and elevated carotene content. Please welcome Dr. Simon. Thanks for that introduction. I'm very glad to be a part of this uh, series of talks. It's a great pleasure to be here at this meeting. And, uh, again, I appreciate the uh, invitation, um, and I appreciate your attendance as well. Uh, I'm going to talk about some of the things that uh, Nate and Sarah and Esther have already spoken about uh, from my perspective uh, as a researcher looking at crop improvement in the, the uh, setting of, uh, of, in particular, carrot improvement uh, with USDA. And I think it's, it's uh, perfectly clear to all of you even be well before you came to this uh, session, that uh, it's the diversity of our crops that uh, ultimately drives their improvement. And in many cases, we go to the, what Nate uh, already told you what the definition of land races are. Land races, heirloom varieties of, uh, in this case, carrots, but other crops as well, as starting materials, or in some cases, close to the ending materials of the crops that we, we improve. Uh, uh, those starting materials started well before they were these land races or heirloom varieties uh, back when uh, hunters and gatherers and early nomadic uh, folks uh, started to domesticate some of these crops that uh, they were picking up along the way when they were wandering through the countryside. And, uh, when I've collected in what was it, at the time the Soviet Union, we saw people picking up garlic uh, in the wild uh, in that particular expedition, uh, for instance. And so this is ongoing yet today, but most of the crops that we, we uh, eat today have been under domestication for some time with examples like uh, three crops here, wheat in, in the upper right-hand corner, some ancient wheat, uh, and in modern wheats, uh, ancient wheats about 15,000 years ago, as it was at the beginning of its domestication, some photos of uh, corn cobs over the last uh, seven-ish thousand years, and you can see what uh, domestication and agriculture has done to the wild progenitors of corn to bring it to what we have today. And then a couple photos of carrot at the top, which has a a much more uh, recent uh, introduction to domestication, probably only about a thousand years as a, as a root crop. Uh, but this process of domestication has been what has, has uh, yielded our crops today. And, uh, and I don't, again, I'm speaking uh, to a group that doesn't need any background on it, but uh, we, we can access crop diversities from several sources with events like the swap that goes on at this meeting as well as with family members and other colleagues. We, of course, can and do buy seeds from seed companies. Uh, there's organizations like Seed Savers and other private and non-government organizations that are focused on collecting and, and uh, providing seeds to be available for the agricultural community and for that matter for backyard farmers and everybody else. And, and uh, I really appreciate Nate's extensive uh, background introduction to the National Plant Germplasm System's GRIN system, which uh, has uh, over half a million accessions, meaning different packets of seed from different sources, from 15,000 species. Of course, not all of those are cultivated, but there's a lot of pretty exotic species there. And, and Nate and, and Sarah and, and Esther talked about some of those uh, common and less common species that we that we are familiar with. Um, the website for the germplasm network is listed in, in the proceedings. I didn't include it here. Uh, and that master web connection has the GRIN uh, 
website as part of it, and I'll come back to that website a little bit later. But uh, another place to find uh, crop diversity is, is where it is, it is in nature and uh, on the land today. And actually, Esther talked about this in collecting land races in Spain. I think that's really great. Uh, Turkey had a program like this, collecting uh, land races of uh, vegetables that they, that they have. And uh, I think this is really great because what I'm going to talk about it on the collecting expedition is something we can hit when we're wandering through villages in the countryside on, uh, on any given day. And uh, to be on the ground and looking for them actively is really great. Uh, similarly, with what Sarah talked about on trips uh, going to abroad and bringing land races uh, back, that's, that's great as well. Again, because uh, the more of us that do that, the more we can, can add to this collection, which I think is, is a good one. And Nate, I don't think you mentioned it, but the seed is available free uh, from that collection. Uh, but uh, in addition to, to those efforts, which again, I really applaud, I'm going to talk about the activities involved in actually going on a formal expedition for collecting germplasm, which is a little more elaborate than what Sarah talked about, um, where you go on the expedition with the sole intent to bring germplasm back. In this case, the germplasm is brought back with you. It does require a phytosanitary certificate as you leave the country, which adds uh, a little bit of pain and suffering, but it's worth it. Uh, but I'm going to start in the beginning and say how you, how you too could uh, go on a collecting expedition. I would certainly invite you to think about it. First of all, you have to figure out what crops or what seed you're going to be picking up, if it is seed, and uh, where you're going to find it. And if you want to find out a little more about where you may find wild relatives of crops, which I'll talk about more than the other speakers did, uh, uh, is uh, to look in botanical flora, which are available for many, but not all regions of the world. And you may know already where you want to go. Uh, there's, a, there's a town in Spain that's got purple carrots that I'd like to get some seed from. I saw it from the internet. And uh, uh, so uh, maybe Esther can provide me with some of those. So there's other sources, but botanical flora are good for the wild relatives especially. especially. And of course, if you know where a crop has been domesticated, that's typically where you're going to find land races to be more common because that's where it started. And that's where you're going to get the really more original materials than what we have today, which really lends to the, the adding to the diversity of this collection if you bring it back in, uh, in a collection like what I'm going to talk about. Uh, as you, if you're interested and have come this far and you, you want to get funded to, to collect, and these are funded expeditions, you will need to contact Crop Germplasm Committee. That's where you'll need to go back to this website that I have listed in the proceedings. Uh, and there are about 40-ish uh, crop germplasm committees uh, uh, that are focused on either different crops or groups of crops. Uh, these are germplasm committees are individuals that have some interest and knowledge of the crops that are in the collection and, uh, and include the curators of the crops as well. So you saw Kathy Wrights' name, for instance, on Nate's presentations, who's a curator of the carrot collection as well as several others. Uh, those germplasm committees uh, provide some uh, necessary input on any collect collecting expedition in that what you need to be proposing to collect fits a need, a need as defined by what I would roughly call a gap analysis, meaning you know, if you're looking for, for, uh, wild, for garlic in Lithuania, are there any garlic in, Lithu in the collection for, in Lithuania already? Uh, and uh, so you, that's the kind of information you want to look at. But when I've gone on expeditions, it's been driven partly by the wild relatives of the crops I work with as well. And so that's been a big motivating factor uh, that, that goes into my collections. Um, but at any rate, uh, you'll, you'll need to contact that germplasm committee. And that information on who to contact is at the website. They need to provide a, a letter to say, yes, this is a good thing to do. We need some germplasm of the, these species there. And uh, generally, they're pretty agreeable. In my experience, uh, if they aren't, let me know, and I'll be glad to see what I can do. But uh, I'm not saying I need to do much. I think that you'll find some good cooperation. Then you need to prepare a proposal, which is several pages. I can get talk more about that if you're interested. But it's not too difficult to do. You have to have a route that you're going to be collecting on, 
Uh, you get some funding to do this primarily for the travel expenses. That's pretty much all of it. And then you have to, the other thing you need to do is this is all run through the USDA, and so this has to be done uh, with a host country that can cooperate. There are a fair number of countries that are not too willing to cooperate with US explorers, and we all come in if you're gonna get USDA money as US explorers, and so a lot of the world isn't uh, gonna be welcoming uh, this. But uh, much of the world is, and uh, consider the possibility and see if you can do it. I would uh, really encourage it if you have an interest in a crop or a collection of crops. So I'm gonna spend the rest of my time on just showing you some photos from some collecting expeditions that that I've been in, involved on, uh, where I've been collecting wild relatives of primarily carrot, onion, and, and garlic, but also other crops, uh, and as well as local land races and cultivars, going back to the idea that mm, this may be the last chance that we have to add the, these local cultivars, and, or even the wild relatives, to the collection, because the next time I go back or somebody else goes back, it may be a parking lot that we picked up the seed, so. Um, so, so in, um, again, to think about how you prepare an expedition proposal or just to think about crops, uh, figure out where the crop comes from. In the case of carrot, most of the 30-ish relatives of carrot come from the Mediterranean basin. So it's a tough life, but somebody's got to go to the Riviera and pick up that germplasm. <laughs> And I've collected on the Riviera, collecting wild carrot with people bathing in the background. I, I should include some pictures of that with uh, some of those photos. Um, uh, it's there, and uh, it's legitimate, and uh, I would encourage you to do it. Um, and there are quite a few crops in that area. Uh, and, uh, but North Africa has got some great germplasm for Dacus as well, and they've had a number of collecting expeditions there. So figure out where your crop is coming from or the wild relatives. These wild relatives we didn't talk much about today, but those wild relatives are really important if you can cross them to the crop you're interested in, because then you have a chance to breed in genes from those wild relatives that are probably or may not at least be in the crop that you're breeding. This has been very important for crop breeders in, uh, throughout history. If we look at not Dacus, uh, in genera, genus more broadly, but wild carrot, it occurs very widely today uh, in these circled areas here, uh, much of uh, northern uh, U.S., roughly from Minnesota to the eastern seaboard and, and in pockets where there's enough moisture to the west of that, much of South America below, uh, southern Brazil and below uh, south, south of that, uh, and then uh, that large region in Eurasia that I've got circled there has wild carrot, so we, I picked up wild carrot in quite a few areas with the idea of embellishing and adding to the germplasm collection of the wild relatives in addition to the carrot itself. Uh, for wild garlic and, it, and those, carrot, those species of allium that are crossable to onion, uh, these occur in Central Asia, uh, roughly from Pakistan uh, to, to, uh, to uh, Central Europe, and uh, that's where wild carrot originated as well, probably in Afghanistan for wild carrot's origin. So again, you have to have a, this is, these aren't very good, easy to see maps, but you have to have a collecting, a plan in mind if you're going on an expedition. So in the case of the Turkish expedition in 1999, I went to Syria and Turkey and uh, started in Izmir in western Turkey and went east uh, over there about as far as Konya and then circled back. Lots of carrots throughout that region. We picked up wild carrots every 50 kilometers or so. It's kind of like driving through uh, northeastern U.S. where there's wild carrot by the millions along the road. So we just picked up a, a few hundred, uh, um, uh, a few dozen umbles uh, every 50 kilometers, as well as stopping at all the villages and farm markets we could find. And then when I went to Syria, which I was really good, glad I went to because there ain't no going back there for anything useful these days. And uh, in fact, uh, the Aleppo pepper that Nate showed, I don't know if you noticed, I picked that up in 1999 when I was there. My name's on the bottom of that list. Uh, so, uh, so we don't just, we, 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 okay, good. <laughs> we don't just pick up uh, the things that we're looking for if we can. Uh, some of the countries are kind of sticky about uh, saying if you're going to pick up carrot and its relatives, then you only pick up carrot and its relatives. In the case of these expeditions, uh, we were allowed to pick up whatever people offered us. And I remember sitting with, in Greece with, a, with a, an herbalist who had 
all kinds of species. I shucked out some artichoke seeds and we brought them back. Uh, it, we brought some opium poppy seeds. That ended up in the opium collection used for standardizing opium by the US. <laughs> so we picked up all kinds of things in these collections and, uh, and uh, we, uh, it's, anyway, we, that, that's a part of the expedition is obviously to have a, some idea of where you want to go and why you want to go there when you're going. Uh, I went on about 10, 11, 12 expeditions. I don't need to go through all of them here, but uh, though, in those parts of the world where the circles are, uh, in, um, in particular in Eurasia, had one expedition over two years in the U.S., but picked up uh, in, in quite a few locations over the year. And this is really some of the most fun I can imagine one doing in one's career. This has really been a great experience. Um, the expedition involves starting with this connection with the, with the local germplasm system, which in many countries isn't very well developed. Uh, and so that can be challenging. Uh, and it, it's always done with a uh, participating local expert, partly because I don't know Syrian or Turkish or Arabic or, or Uzbek, and so uh, that's a part of it, but also because we always leave a portion, roughly half of the seed of every accession collected with those locals. Uh, they typically have some agreement that we get some funding as well uh, as part of it. All the seed that's collected must meet APHIS health requirements that Sarah talked a little bit about, and, and it becomes, all becomes a part of the National Plan germplasm system, so these will become future accessions in the germplasm collection, plant introductions, if they're able to be increased. Sometimes you get things back and you don't get any seed off of it and it's, it's lost. Some, with some of the collecting, it's done under extended material uh, transfer agreements, which limit some of the use, but typically it's uh, freely available. I don't, uh, so pick up things in seed and uh, seeds and bulbs in markets, in local markets. This is in Turkmenistan, some garlic, and some uh, carrot products as well as some carrot seed in Tajikistan in 1989. And uh, some garlic we picked up in Syria in 1999. I would hope that's still ongoing, I have my doubts. This is Teresa Kotlinska from Poland who collected with me on these expeditions, some of these expeditions. And we purchased seed from local farmers uh, as well. And this is really great fun because uh, Sarah talked about this uh, where, you're, where you're talking to people uh, in these countries and they say, what the heck are you doing here? Why is this American asking about my carrots? And then you share your experience and you quickly can engage people uh, with, with a lot of interest. Uh, and on the left is a photo with uh, some uh, people talking to Teresa Kotlinska and I, uh, which we just saw sitting along the road in a village in Poland, uh, an elderly farm couple that opened up their, some seed packets they had, and uh, some growers of local seed of some cucurbits and, and carrot uh, in, in eastern Poland on that trip. Uh, an Uzbek farmer in 2004 where we got some garlic, and she also was growing carrot seed. Uh, Tunisian farmer on the right of this picture and then some of the local uh, extension folks in Tunisia in a vacant lot in Tunisia where he had a fairly large organic farm. And uh, then collecting bulbs and seeds from wild landscapes, uh, Turkmenistan 1989 where wild garlic and carrot occurs, Uzbekistan it's a little drier where we picked up carrot and garlic, but uh, it's a good place. Bassam al Safadi, my uh, former grad student with me, that was my col collaborator in Syria, uh, helped uh, with that collecting expedition in 1999. Uh, olive groves are a good place to find wild carrot. And in Uzbekistan 2004, some of the local farmers heard we were interested in garlic, and this guy that somehow reminded me of Jack Black on the left holding the garlic plants uh, brought us some uh, wild garlic, and we paid him for them and put them in the collection, and, and, and along with my uh, collaborator here on the right-hand picture and the local farmer. Sometimes the wild relatives are in even more exotic places like Dacus sahariensis, which is crossable with carrot and occurs on the edge of the Saharan desert uh, around where the some of the Star Wars movies were made in Tunisia, uh, and uh, we picked that up. Uh, I won't get, spend any time because the last, we're done with our time here pretty much, but uh, the Crop Germplasm Committee information is available at the web, at that site that I mentioned. And uh, evaluation is important, ultimately. There are also funds available if you're interested in, in evaluating some of this germplasm, and we can talk about that, but uh, just to end things up, uh, the collecting expeditions have broadened the 
the uh, germplasm that we have. It also helps broaden our understanding of the origins of the crop and their re relationships to the wild relatives, which helps us understand how to proceed in plant breeding in many cases. And it's provided new germplasm in things like some of the nematode resistance, garlic seed production, and many of the materials that we have in the carrot improvement for organic agriculture uh, project underway. So thank you very much for your time. <laughs>